Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you considered the cost? The cost of following Jesus. You may have heard of a book called Dietrich, by Dietrich Bonhoeffer called The Cost of Discipleship. And this theme of the cost of following Jesus has been around since the very beginning of the church. Have you considered the cost? Well, our gospel reading helps us consider the cost of setting our resolve, aided by the Holy Spirit, to want to follow Jesus. C.S. Lewis has a great quote from Mere Christianity, which just happens to be one of the things we're encouraging you to read over the summer. So here's a little piece to kind of entice you. Um, And this quote talks about the difference in our vision versus Christ's vision, in that we sort of think we invite Jesus in, which we don't. He's the God of all things. He comes in on His own. And we understand and expect Him to do certain things, but He does more than we expect. So Lewis writes, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what He is doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. In other words, we expect and agree with what some of Jesus has come to do in our life. The obvious things, the broken drains and the leaking roof, the cracked wall, etc., But we get more than we bargain for when Jesus is around because He doesn't stop where we would because He has something far greater in mind for you than you can envision yourself. Well, our gospel reading this morning highlights some of the unexpected things that come into our lives with Jesus. And some of them aren't so easy. As Lewis says, When Jesus starts knocking that house about, it can hurt, and we don't know what's going on. So let's dig in. Luke chapter 9, verse 51, the very first verse of our reading today, represents a big key shift in the entire gospel narrative of Luke. And if you blink, you might miss it. It seems like an insignificant verse. Here's how it reads. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. That seems like a filler sentence. What's the significance of that? Well, the significance is that this is a directional statement after which everything else changes its orientation. It would be like you saying when you're younger, I'm going to become a lawyer, I'm going to become a doctor, I'm going to become a pastor, a nurse, I'm going to become etc. Small statement. But after that, If your resolve is set, everything shifts in a new direction. That's what verse 51 is all about. And there are two key parts to this verse for us to understand really what's at stake. The first one is, he set his face. And that's kind of hard for us to understand because we don't talk that way. I don't say to my wife, I've set my face to go to the grocery store today. That would be an odd thing to say, right? That sounds funny. We don't talk that way. But in the Scriptures, this phrase denotes a gathering of resolve. It speaks to the intention of the subject. So in the Old Testament, for example, when in Jeremiah 21, when God sets His face against the people, it's not good because He's expressing His intention to oppose them. 
Well, here, Jesus is doing the same thing. He's setting his face. He's firming up his resolve. He's made his decision. That's what that phrase means. Now we have to answer the question of what has he set his resolve for? And the the verse says, to go to Jerusalem. Now, this isn't like when you say to yourself, I would really like to go to Italy. He's not talking about just wanting to go to the city of Jerusalem to see the wonderful sights and see the temple and all of that. He set his face to go to Jerusalem because that is where his heavenly Father has called him to fulfill God's plan of salvation through his death on the cross. Jesus has resolved himself to this fate. And so after verse 51, the entire gospel of Luke shifts in that direction. His resolve is set. So what happens next? Jesus has set his face. He's made his decision to go to Jerusalem to fulfill God's plan of salvation. And the very first thing that happens is he sends his messengers ahead of him, and they are rejected. And by extension, he himself is rejected by the people of Samaria. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever resolved to do something and the very first thing you encounter is no? A rejection? It brought to my mind, um, I read Stephen King's memoir on writing, and one of the things he talks about is how many rejection letters he got before his first book got published. And he describes that he put them on a nail in his attic, but it got so heavy that he had to replace the nail with a railroad spike. That can be discouraging and disheartening. And the reason Stephen King is writing about that is because he didn't give up because of that rejection, but often we do. So Jesus sets his face and his resolve and is rejected. Why is he rejected? Were his messengers rude and unkind? Did they spit on the customs and rituals of Samaria? No. The text tells us why they were rejected. They were rejected because he had set his face to go to Jerusalem. Because they knew his destination. You see, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. And the Samaritans did not agree that Jerusalem was the seat of worship, the worship of God. But even more so, what Jesus was there to do was the source of this rejection. It was the very call of God, His Heavenly Father, that caused them to turn away from Him. So, so far, Jesus sets His resolve because his heavenly Father has commanded him to do so, and for that, he is rejected. The very Son of God himself is rejected. What hope is there for us? What's going to happen to us, those who follow him? Well, that brings us to the next section in this text, and that's where the relationship with this resolve of Jesus gets connected to the disciples and those who follow him. And you hear familiar phrases, discipleship calling phrases, Jesus saying, follow me, and people saying, I will follow you wherever you go. So Jesus and his disciples, they've been rejected. The disciples want to respond with wrath, and Jesus rebukes them, and it says they go on to another village. So they continue on their journey, and they encounter three potential disciples. And each of these three have a very interesting interaction with Jesus. I think Jesus would probably be booed out of outreach meetings for some of his responses here. The first one, the disciple reaches out to him and says, I will follow you wherever you go. That's a statement of resolve. He set his face to follow Jesus. And here's Jesus' response. Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to to lay his head. Consider the cost. If you follow me, you won't fit in anywhere. There will be no place of respite on the earth for you. 
for the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I'm going to Jerusalem, and you don't know what awaits me there, but I do. The second, in this one, Jesus initiates himself by saying, follow me. But the man responds with, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. To which Jesus responds, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and pro proclaim the kingdom of God. In the Greek, there is more like, as you're going, proclaim the kingdom of God. That seems pretty harsh. I mean, this is a really important ritual to the Jews, the burying of their dead, as it is for us. And yet Jesus says there's no time for that. Go and proclaim the kingdom of God. If we really think about that, it makes some sense. After all, what earthly cares trump the call of Jesus? Follow me. Even the most important rituals, and this is why this example was chosen, even the most important of our earthly rituals are not more important than the call of Jesus. And third, the last encounter, another says to Jesus after this, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Again, another example of an important ritual within society. This was a big part of the ethos of hospitality at this time. It would have been considered very rude to depart without doing this. And then Jesus gives perhaps his most harsh response of all. He says, no one who put his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Man, Jesus is giving some tough words for us to wrestle with this morning. And you might be thinking at this rate, <laughs> he's not going to have any disciples. You've got to abandon all of your important earthly rituals to follow me. That's a tough price pay. Well, follow me, and I will follow you wherever you go, are statements that set one's face, that set a resolve, that point in a direction, that of Jesus. And after that, everything has changed. Those among us who came to faith later in life know this. Once that happens, the rest changes. The direction of your life is different. Yet why did all three of these examples fizzle out? After all, the disciples that Jesus has already called and that are following him, they're not impressive, not by earthly standards. They're fishermen. Some of them are completely uneducated. And they regularly misunderstand what Jesus is saying. So what is up with the harshness here? And like the example I gave for the kids, I'm shocked by the response of some of the disciples Jesus calls. They simply leave everything behind, including dear old dad mending the nets and follow Jesus. Well, there's a, there's a difference in those responses with, them, with these. You see, with these, they wanted to encounter Jesus on their own terms. They wanted that interaction to go the way they wished and not the way Jesus did. They wanted Him to wait for them to finish up with what they thought was important. How often do we do that? Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Lord, but I've got this other thing I need to do. Just give me a moment. Do we listen when Jesus calls us? Now, if you're here this morning, the answer to that is, yeah, we do. Right? We've been given faith as a gracious gift of God from, via the Holy Spirit through hearing God's Word. And in response to that, like the disciples, we do follow Him. That's why you're here. And as for the question to consider the cost, coming here this morning is a small example even of that truth about being a disciple of Jesus. You could be asleep right now. 
You could be having an amazing brunch with a bunch of your friends. You could have spent the night last night at a friend's house and been playing video games when you woke up the next day or just slowly waking up in the morning as you're eating a nice breakfast. But you're not doing any of those things. You're here. Because Jesus called you. And you listened. But the truth remains the same. In Lewis's quote that I shared earlier, both for the 12 disciples and for us. We think we know what Jesus is up to in our lives, but often we don't. We have a much smaller idea of what He has planned for us than He actually does. And after hearing this and the examples of the the potential disciples that Jesus rebukes, you might be thinking to yourself, am I really a disciple of Jesus? Do I really have to be willing to leave everything behind to follow Him, even neglecting the most important earthly rituals? The text answers, yes, you do. When you became a member of this congregation or any LCMS congregation, one of the questions that you're asked to make a confession about is that do you desire to cling to this faith and forsaking all other things, even at death, rather than fall away from it? And the answer to that question is yes, with the help of God. You said that. Recognizing the truth of this calling that when Jesus comes into your life, it's not for part of it, but for the whole thing. He's not just come to fix the things that you wanted Him to. He's come to turn you into something much more. Now, you may be thinking, that's too hard, I can't do that. And if that's your thought, then again, you are correct. You cannot. You and I are not fit for the kingdom of God. That's why that rebuke of Jesus hits so harshly. Because we look back, don't we? We get bogged down in the cares of the world. We think that we're meeting Jesus on our own terms, that we can tell Him how we ought to spend our time and what we ought to prioritize. So what hope is there for us? Well, notice that after the rejection of Samaria, the disciples would have the response that we would, right? Well, this person is ignoring me and disrespecting me or disrespecting somebody that I admire. Let's call down some fire from heaven so they all die because they should know better. How often have you thought that about yourself or maybe about other people? And yet what does Jesus do? He rebukes them. And they continue on because he knows what he's about. When those days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Therein lies our hope. Our resolve is weak, but Jesus' resolve is unflappable. We crumble at rejection, but Jesus does not. And we want to answer rejection with wrath, but Jesus extends a hand of mercy. We want to follow Him, but at times the cost overwhelms us. Thanks be to God that we aren't doing this on our own. He has given us His Holy Spirit. Only with this aid can we hear and believe Jesus when He calls out to us, follow me. Through that wondrous, gracious gift of faith, because of what Jesus did in Jerusalem. So Jesus does go to Jerusalem. He's, his resolve endures every attack, rejection, broken relationship, and even death to win salvation for us. That is the resolve of our faith. We have set our faces with the aid of the Holy Spirit to follow Him. Have you considered the cost of following Jesus? It's not going to be on your terms. It will demand sacrifice, and you have to be ready 
to leave behind family fortunes and even your life. Yet, emboldened by the Spirit, our resolve is set, knowing that when we fall and stumble, what awaits us is not wrath, but our Lord's extended hand of mercy, offering us forgiveness for our failures and our weak resolve, and bolstering us with His perfect, unflappable one. So too, then we are no longer being made into some small cottage. Christ has much more in store for each of you. He intends to build you into a palace fit for Him to come and live, and so He does. So we go out and follow Him, struggling and striving, desiring, failing, being forgiven, and going out again until He comes again to make everything new. Amen.